Yeah, I see that there are folks joining us. Um, we're going to take a couple of minutes to allow people to sign on. It's just 12 p.m. right now. We're going to be talking about the contested case hearing that concluded last week in the polymet permit to mine matter. So again, if you're just joining us, we're going to wait another minute or so to allow other folks to sign on. Looks like we have a good turnout for the webinar today. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, again, we're talking about the contested case hearing in the polymet permit to mine case. Um, we just concluded the hearing last week on Friday. We're excited to let people know a little bit about what happened last week. We're going to get started in just I don't know, 30 more seconds. Looks like some people are still joining. All right, um, let's go ahead. So welcome everybody. My name is Kevin Ruther. I am the Chief Legal Officer and Deputy Director here at MCEA, the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. We're happy to welcome you today to this webinar. Um, we're going to be talking about the contested case hearing in the PolyMet Permit to Mine matter. The, the hearing just concluded last week on Friday. Uh, with me today are Max Kiley and Heidi Gunther. Hi, Max and Heidi. Um, Max is the legal director and general counsel at the Friends of the Boundary Waters, one of our clients in this case. And Heidi is working here with us at MCEA. She's a new lawyer and is our legal fellow. So happy to have you both um, here today. What we have planned is um, about 50 minutes and uh, big picture, there are three things that we want to cover. Um, first, how we got here, how did we end up um, here with the uh, contested case hearing. Um, second, what happened at the hearing last week? And then third, uh, where we're going from here. Uh, we want to definitely save some time for your questions. And so um, what we're going to do is use the Q&A box down in the middle of your screen. If you look at the bottom of your screen, it says Q&A. Don't put your questions in the chat. I'm not going to monitor the chat, but I am going to monitor the Q&A. So if you have a question as we're going through, um, I'll take a look at those and we'll hopefully get to as many as we can. Um, it looks like uh, there is somebody signed on. I think it's Eric as me on my screen. If you want to get off there, that might be helpful. Okay, so let's launch right in. I'm going to give a little bit of background um, before we get to the hearing part of our webinar just so that we're all on the same page about PolyMet. I know that most of you are probably familiar with the basics of PolyMet, but um, you know, Minnesota has a long history of iron mining, obviously. And what, what PolyMet is proposing is really different. Um, what they propose is a sulfide mine, what we call sulfide mine. They're mining for copper and nickel. And when water and oxygen come into contact with the sulfides in this kind of an ore, they can create acid, um, what's sometimes referred to as acid mine drainage, which has plagued many of these types of mines in the past. Uh, PolyMet is the first company to propose and get a permit for this type of mining in Minnesota. And we care so much about this because um, if we're going to be mining these minerals in Minnesota, we really have to get it right. And so the first proposal is the place where we need to get it right. Um, PolyMet's own modeling uh, shows that this mined waste will remain reactive, meaning that it can still generate acid for up to 500 years. So that's five centuries of possible water pollution. The threat to our water, uh, especially to downstream communities, is very real. And that's why we're really focused on this proposal. Um, a quick timeline. So our efforts to get the truth out about 
Polymet's proposal and sulfide mining really began almost 20 years ago. It was back in 2004 that Polymet first proposed this mine. And um, they then went through about a decade of environmental review. The first environmental review document was actually rejected by the EPA as inadequate. And uh, I think it was in 2015, there, they published a supplement or a second EIS. And it was after that then that the agencies could move forward with permitting. Um, this is a huge project. And so there are a lot of government agencies involved. Um, the ones in Minnesota are the Pollution Control Agency and the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources. At the federal level, um, the Forest Service had to make a decision that uh, paved the way for this proposal. And then also uh, the Army Corps of Engineers regulates the wetlands that are going to be destroyed. So you've got multiple agencies. And by 2018, those decisions and permits from those agencies had been granted to Polymet. It was after that, that we then pursued our legal challenges. And each one of the permits, each one of the decisions by all of those agencies was appealed or challenged in some way. And all of those appeals and challenges are still pending um, either before an agency or in a court. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today stems from the permit to mine. And that was issued by the DNR. So it's really the DNR's permit. They issued two permits, the permit to mine and the dam safety permit. And those two permit appeals were consolidated and led eventually um, to the decision of the Supreme Court uh, that uh, we were entitled to this contested case that we're going to be talking about. I want to share my screen really quick and just show you an overview picture of the North Met mine. Um, hopefully you're seeing my screen uh, here in my cursor. This area over on the right side of the picture is the mine site. So right now this is pristine headwaters for the Partridge River and wetlands. This is all going to be dug out. Um, and so Polymet proposes to mine the ore here, take it over to a processing facility. Uh, they're using, a, using an existing facility, the old LTV mine site. And the ore will then be crushed here at the processing facility. And the waste will then go into this huge tailings basin called the flotation tailings basin. Um, there's really a lot of waste genera generated by this type of mining. 90, over 99% of the rock that's coming out of the earth is going to end up as waste. Um, a very small percent is the actual minerals that they're, that they're after. And so it's this flotation tailings basin that we're really gonna be talking about today and the storage of this waste because the waste is reactive. That's what can generate the acid mine drainage. Um, let's see, so when these permits were issued to allow for the mining and the processing and the construction of this storage facility, the storage method, we appealed those permits, those DNR permits to the Court of Appeals. And we, we made both legal and procedural arguments um, challenging the permits. And the Court of Appeals agreed with us on you know, nearly all of our arguments. Um, Polymet and DNR then appealed that further to the Minnesota Supreme Court. And the Minnesota Supreme Court really focused in on our procedural argument, which had to do with the lack of a contested case. We had um, applied and uh, petitioned the DNR to do a contested case before it issued the permit, and DNR denied that on just a variety of different issues. The Supreme Court honed in, uh, honed in on bentonite um, as the issue that was not adequately um, addressed in DNR's record and said that we were entitled to a contested case on the issue of bentonite. So real quick, um, bentonite is clay and Polymet wants to use bentonite to create a barrier to protect water quality by preventing water and oxygen from reaching the tailings um, and then creating this acid mine drainage. Now, I wanna share one more quick uh, image with you. 
if I can pull that up, there it is. This is a view of that tailings basin that I was pointing at on the other image. So you can see the pond here on the left and these step looking things are the dam. And then over here, um, you see a cross section of the tailings basin. So what's gonna happen, what's proposed to happen is that this gray area is the reactive tailings. Uh, and Polymet wants to stack up these tailings, um, build a dam on the side, have a pond up here on the top, so they're covered in water, and line all of this with that bentonite clay. So you see this green line here, all along here is bentonite. It's gonna go under the pond, up on the beaches, and all along the dam. Here's another a version of it, you can see that it's it's actually the yellow in this line here. And we'll we'll take a look at that again a little bit later, but it gives you a sense of what we're talking about. That's where the bentonite is um, supposed to go. So um, that's all by way of background. I want to turn now first to you, Max. I've described or, or said that the Supreme Court said that we were entitled to a contested case, but can you um, give folks an understanding of what a contested case is at all? Yeah, sure, Kevin, um, and, and thanks for having me on. Um, uh, contested case hearings at the state level here in Minnesota are held at the Office of Administrative Hearings, which is an impartial, unbiased um, executive branch agency, and it conducts effectively evidentiary hearings on behalf of either local governments or uh, state agencies or boards. And the administrative law judge, um, in essence, is trying to uh, establish a record to establish facts um, uh, upon which to base, uh, you know, legal conclusions. And uh, the, the facts are submitted either through uh, pre-filed testimony uh, or live testimony or a combination of those two, and then documentary evidence that is submitted. Um, and, and that is basically what a contested case hearing is. And, and then I'll also note that a contested case hearing, typically um, an administrative law judge issues at the end a report and recommendation, which an agency or board or local government can either adopt or modify or change. And the ultimate decision maker, typically, there are some exceptions, but typically is the, the agency itself. So DNR here in this instance would be the ultimate decision maker. So DNR can reject the recommendation of the ALJ if they decide to, is what you're saying? Yes, but the, you know, you, so for example, if there's a um, particular fact or legal conclusion that is modified or altered by the DNR, they can't just say, we disagree. They have to provide some sort of rational um, explanation as to why they disagree. So it, it, you know, it, it can't be just simply, nope, we disagree and it's, it's this. They have to say it, it's this because X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Heidi, um, tell us a little bit about the contested case from last week. Uh, who were the parties? What did it look like in that courtroom? Give us a sense of what was going on over in St. Paul last week. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it was a pretty full room. Um, we had a lot of attorneys present on both sides. Um, so on petitioner side, our side, um, we MCEA represented the conservation organizations. And so we represented the interests of MCEA, Friends of the Boundary Waters, Save Our Blue Sky, well, wow, <laughs> Save Our Sky Blue Waters, my apologies, uh, Save Lake Superior Association, Duluth for Clean Water, and the Center for Biological Diversity. And Water Legacy and the Fond du Lac Band were also parties as petitioners in this case as well, and also were present to participate in cross-examination. Um, and then on the opposing side, we had PolyMet and the Department of Natural Resources. Great. Um, and I've mentioned that the Supreme Court said that we were entitled to a contested case on bentonite. Um, they also said that DNR could, you know, incorporate other issues if it wanted to as it turns out, it didn't. It focused on bentonite. So maybe you can walk us through the way that DNR um, identified the issues that it wanted 
discussed in the in the contested case here? Yeah, so after the Supreme Court made their decision to issue this requirement for a contested case hearing, DNR issued an amended hearing order, and this was in February of 2022, and they identified five factual disputes that this hearing would um, incorporate the scope of. So the first is how bentonite would be applied to the tailing space and sides, beaches, and pond bottom to en ensure its effectiveness in reducing infiltration of oxygen and water into the stored tailings over time. So, so this what's is the, if I can just ask, I'm going to kind of ask you to describe, I think, as we go through each of the five questions, what the dispute is about, like what's the factual dispute as to the application of, of um, bentonite here? Of course. So this first factual dispute um, is basically how the bentonite will be applied. Can it be applied uniformly? What tools will be used? Um, can it be mixed with or without peeling back that top layer? It's all of the mechanics of how we Polymet actually proposes to have bentonite applied to the basin sides, beaches, and pond bottom. Okay, so I'm going to share this um, image again. And what what you're talking about is, um, or maybe you can describe here on the lower right, um, if everybody can see that, where the bentonite is going. So this is on a beach or the, the sides, right, on the lower right. Um, how has uh, Polymet proposed to create that layer? It looks like it's a layer under some earth but on top of the tailings. Yeah, so the tailings are pre-existing. Um, they're the LTV tailings. And initially there was just going, the plan was to just mix in the bentonite to be uniformed. Now there's a possibility of peeling back that top layer to then mix and then overlay once again. Um, so the bentonite needs to be uniformed. And that that is part of the larger issue and whether or not we even have the tools, and by we, I mean um, industry in general, have the tools to be able to make that bentonite and soil a uniform application so that it creates that um, protective layer that's necessary for any water or oxygen to come through. Okay. Um, what was the second issue? So the second issue is how should the application methods of the bentonite be evaluated or tested? before application to ensure the effectiveness in reducing this infiltration of oxygen and water into the stored tailings. So this is really about um, the testing before it's done. But I mean, we should point out that this is a reclamation technique. This is like what happens 20 years after they've already been mining, right? Correct, yes. So what is the controversy around testing? So, as far as we are able to establish, there's really only been one significant test. Um, and Polymet has asserted that as time elapses, they will continue to test and that any future testing can then be modified to, re to recalibrate and pivot for any variables that occur, any necessary information that comes in. Um, whereas our assertion is we need to know this now. This needs to be done now so that we are able to plan and ensure that all of our waters are protected and continue to be protected over time. To not wait until 20 years from now um, to find out whether or not this plan works. Yeah, it did seem in the hearing like testing um, and the number of tests and whether they were done in a lab or in the field, all that kind of stuff was a really big issue in the hearing. Maybe we can get into that a little bit. And, and um, I'll, I'll just... Go ahead, Max. Sorry, I'll, yeah. I'll just step in and say, you know, the currently Polymet has the ability to perform tests, right? I mean, part of the, the future testing will be measuring probably various uh, percentages of bentonite tailings mixture, right? What types of bentonite to use, whether it's powdered or granulated. And so there, there are existing LTV tailings and there are, are existing, uh, you know, pilot um, plant, you know, um, tailings from the North Met site where there could be uh, field testing right now. Polymet has the potential to do it, has chosen not to do it. Okay. Uh, how about the third issue? 
So the third issue is would the pond bottom bentonite amended cover be effective in maintaining a permanent pond that acts as a water cover over the stored tailings? Okay, so this is trying to get the bentonite on the bottom of the pond when the pond is already there. Is that right? Correct, yes. So the pond already exists um, and PolyMet has a few different application methods that they propose to have that subaqueous application of bentonite. Um, but it should be noted that throughout this contested case hearings development, they have they have not been um, firm on whether or not the pond bottom will be applied with bentonite. That has slowly shifted and changed over time. Um, so they're currently their current stances, it may or may not um, require bentonite in order to maintain the pond bottom's efficacy. Mm -hmm. Well, one of my favorite images from the hearing was this. If I mean, if they do conclude that they're going to need bentonite on the bottom of the pond, um, they have one technique, which was this graph that they used and I think that we use. Maybe you can describe what's going on here. Um, yes, can you just pull up the graph quickly? I'm seeing it, the background right now. Oh, maybe I'm sharing the wrong thing. Hmm. There, do you see the image now? Oh, perfect, great. Yes, so this was one of the images that was put in, um, one of the graphics that was that was in the actual um, proposed app, uh, plan that PolyMet submitted in its application. And this is a GPS barge that is intended to um, distribute bentonite across the pond bottom subaqueously. And it this, for perspective, this is supposed to occur over over 900 acres and provide a uniformed application. Um, so the idea is that this barge will go back and forth, back and forth, and be able to succeed in this application of bentonite, either pellets or granulated. We're not we're not sure yet um, across the, the the pond bottom. Maybe you can say too. Why is it important? Do we think that there be some barrier at the pond bottom? Yeah, so the pond bottom itself, it will how house all of the tailings waste. So all of the mine waste that is created will go into this pond, and then you will have precipitation come through. You'll have snow come through, which is precipitation, but you'll have this freezing and um, this heating up as the seasons change. And this will continuously create new water and new chemical reactions with these tailings as more and more tailings are put through. And so you need something on that bottom so that the groundwater doesn't become infiltrated with all of those chemical reactions that are occurring in this uh, storage facility. Great, thanks. Max, do you wanna add yeah. anything more? Yeah, Yeah. thanks. I, I was just gonna say, you know, and what's crazy about this is Polymed is sitting here saying we might not even need bentonite at the bottom of the pond, right? And, and you know, to, to sort of, uh, you know, piggyback on Heidi's answer about why is this needed, it's needed to, to create effectively a seal so water doesn't infiltrate the reactive tailings and create, ac you know, acid mine drainage. And it's really precarious because this bentonite amendment, as planned, allows for, um, is tailored to allow for a specific amount of precipitation to seep or flow through per year. And if there's too much, there's going to be an issue. And if there's too little precipitation or, you know, uh, seepage, there's going to be issues. So this is, this is, you know, a hope and a prayer to get things right over 500 years. And there's a lot at stake. Yeah. Well, and I think the 500 year thing is particularly um, scary. Uh, what's the fourth issue? So the fourth issue is, would any conditions in the pond result in cation exchange that could reduce the effectiveness of bentonite in reducing that infiltration of oxygen and water into the stored tailings? Um, so while well, we were debating uh, how far we should go into cation exchange when we were preparing for this webinar, um, who wants to describe what that's about? 
uh, in regular English for folks on the line here today. Heidi, you want to give it a shot? Sure, I'll I'll start off, and Max, feel free to join in. Um, so. Cation exchange is a geochemical reaction that will occur. Um, but the larger question here is whether it will occur to the extent that it compromises the bentonite's ability to swell um, and maintain that swelling. So the bentonite, um, as it's saturated, as it becomes wet, it swells to create much bigger barrier, and it's supposed to stay that way. And cation exchange and the level of cation exchange that occurs um, will it will be one of the things that decreases that swell and makes it less effective of a barrier. I think that that was a good explanation. Thanks, Heidi. You're yeah. welcome. How about the last issue? So our last issue is how would PolyMet ensure bentonite's effectiveness in reducing infiltration of oxygen and water into the stored tailings over time? Okay. And this this factual dispute speaks to the larger question in general. Can this proposed design actually work and can it work in perpetuity? Can this plan be effective for 500 plus years? Great. So we have a lot of really technical issues, but they're centered just on bentonite. And I just want to really um, emphasize for folks that bentonite is one very narrow issue in this entire um, proposal and among all of the issues that we are concerned about. Uh, one of the things that the Supreme Court said when they remanded to DNR is that DNR could have a broader contested case hearing and discuss some of the other disputed issues that we had raised. Um, that's not what happened, but I'd like you guys to discuss a little bit about what, what were some of the other issues that we're concerned with and why is it that those are not part of this contested case hearing? Yeah, sure, Kevin, I'll, I'll take that one. And, you know, I'll, I'll say just as a member of the public, it's sort of baffling to me, right? DNR has this opportunity to demonstrate that it is impartial, unbiased, and just really wants to build a factual record. Um, and what happened was DNR limiting this hearing to the, the, the smallest amount possible, right? And, and it's sort of frustrating. I mean, I think there are a variety of other issues that DNR should have explored further. And I'll, I'll just provide a couple examples. The first is the adequacy of the dam safety permits as to the upstream dam construction, right? And upstream dam construction is effectively taking existing wet, non-compacted tailings and building, you know, a, a flotation tailings basin on top of that with um, wet non-compacted tailings. So effectively you're building like a ziggurat with different steps and each step is, you know, additional wet non-compacted tailings. Now, this is problematic for a couple of reasons. It's problematic because up, the upstream method is prone to um, collapse through something called liquefaction. And, and effectively that's like a seismic event where due to the fact that the, the steps are made of non-compacted and wet tailings, you have something that effectively looks and acts like a solid, but then turns liquid and um, collapses. This has happened um, multiple times, including uh, in, in 2019 at the Brumadinho um, dam collapse in Brazil, same upstream method. And what's so problematic is that resulted in the loss of life, 250 people, and that resulted in six to eight billion dollars in damages afterwards, right? Why, why are we relying, why is DNR allowing PolyMet to rely on outdated uh, technology that has caused, you know, death and destruction, right? Uh, another is alternatives to wet closure. Wet closure, we're talking where we have a pond over the top, right? Um, and a pond over the top of the tailings, uh, when you're supposed to prevent water from entering the tailings, seems like not the best idea, right? Um, there are other alternatives out there. Other alternatives include dry stacking or dry closure. And dry closure would be instead of adding a pond on top when you're trying to keep water, you effectively put some sort of geosynthetic liner or membrane uh, over the top of uh, the tailings and, and call it a day. And then dry stacking is sort of taking 
effectively taking and making pancakes of uh, tailings, right? Removing the water and putting that on uh, over uh, and storing them on a, some sort of uh, geosynthetic liner as well. Um, again, you know, DNR vigorously objected when when anybody even mentioned, you know, dry stacking, dry closure, or you know, anything geared towards the discussion of uh, an alternative to having a pond at the top. Um, and, and finally, um, you know, financial assurance. Financial assurance to me is a huge issue. And, you know, it's a huge issue because due to the upstream construction method, right, you could have a collapse. And you want to make sure that there's enough money in PolyMet's piggy bank. So if there is, you know, a high cost um, uh, event, right, that PolyMet pays for it, not Minnesota taxpayers. Um, I, I will put in a quick plug here, Kevin. Sorry for the shameless promotion, but Friends of the Boundary Waters also is a champion of Taxpayer Protection Act. And that seeks to do, you know, exactly what I'm talking about, to make sure that there's enough money up front so PolyMet doesn't, you know, make profits, cause damage and pollution, declare bankruptcy after it's shipped that money, uh, you know, to a different country. Great. Thanks, Max. So there are a number of other issues um, that could have been part of this contested case hearing. And part of the problem for us, and Heidi, maybe you can talk about this a little bit, is that they're really kind of intertwined with the bentonite issue. It's not that easy to separate one out from the other. Um, we did try to get the DNR, convince the DNR and the judge um, to look at some of these issues. Heidi, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, we did. Um, and you're correct. They are they are very intertwined. And I think that as this case has developed, it's even it, it's become even more illuminated how and intertwined and how interrelated these things are. Um, so petitioners um, filed motions and petition to have the scope of this hearing expanded to include all of these topics that we're, ta we're talking about, um, and it was denied. And even in direct testimony, the pre-file direct testimony and the testimony that was presented at the contested case hearing, the experts themselves, it was a, it was a challenge to be able to explain bentonite, um, regardless of which side you were on, on the whether this or will, will or will not work. It was hard to have that discussion without getting into a lot of these other topics. Um, there's other engineering controls. You know, the water seepage capture system is is one, and that plays into whether that 6.5 inches per year um, can be maintained and whether or not it can be a crutch. And, you know, there were objections all throughout this contested case hearing because of experts veering into that space, or at least being um, opposing counsel being fearful that they were, um, on, again, on, on both sides, because it's it's hard to find a clear delineation, a clear point of this is the, this falls within the five factual disputes that are allowed, and this falls on the other side because of that intertwined nature. Yeah, yeah, okay. Max, do you want to say something to that? Yeah, sure. Sorry to step on your toes there, Kevin. And, and to, just to jump in too, what's even more baffling is Heidi mentioned, you know, the um, seepage collection system, right? Um, that is baked into uh, and is a requirement of the reactive mine waste rule. And, and, you know, I'm just going to quote the language here, right? So there's, you know, I broke this down earlier. There's two ways to uh, comply with that. First is either neutralize the waste so it's no longer reactive or to store it in a manner such that it's no longer reactive. The second is to prevent substantially all water from moving through that. But addition, in, in addition to that, you need to collect and dispose of any remaining water that drains from the mine waste, right? Which is the, you know, seepage and collection system. So effectively, we're having a contested case hearing about whether or not the bentonite amendment, uh, you know, can satisfy the DNR's reactive mine waste rule. And part of that relies on the efficacy of the seepage coll uh, collection system, which we were forbidden from discussing. Yeah, yeah. So we're left with a uh, hearing for a week focused just on bentonite and um, that's what we did. Um, and we also were given the burden of proof in this case. Max, I know that you wanna comment a little bit about that, but why don't you tell folks what the overall legal standard is that applies here? 
Yeah, sure, Kevin, and thanks. And I apologize, I was sort of previewing that a, a second ago. So no the, the legal standard here is whether or not it's uh, quote unquote practical and workable and that statutory language, right? For the, whether the Bentonite Amendment is a practical and workable, um, you know, uh, reclamation technique to satisfy DNR's reactive mine waste rule. Um, so, you know, here, you know, um, uh, effectively, there needs to be a demonstration that the bentonite amendment will either, you know, neutralize the waste, you know, store it in a in, in a neutralized environment, or s prevent substantially all water from passing through, you know, through the tailings basin. Um, interestingly, here the administrative law judge found that it was petitioners, you know, MCA friends. MCA's other clients, the band, Water Legacy, it was our burden of proof to prove a negative, to establish that the Bentonite Amendment wouldn't work, wouldn't be practical and workable. And, you know, I find that a, a, a little odd. Um, typically, you know, just generally speaking in these types of situations, when you're challenging the status quo, right, you're trying to change the status quo, you have the burden of proof. The Supreme Court here took away DNR's permit to mine. Polymet is trying to get that back. Polymet is trying to change the status quo. Polymet should have the burden of proof. Yeah, okay. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more specifically about what happened um, last week. Heidi, you wanna tell us sort of what the main arguments were coming out for, for the different sides? Um, what were the highlights? What were some of the highlights? Yes. So the arguments fell on the sides you would expect them to be for the most part. You know, um, Polymet asserted that bentonite clay is a geological substance that has been around for decades and decades and decades and has been used and um, has shown its effectiveness for eons um that well, it can didn't be say that it was used in the aquifers in rome <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah the aqueducts or, or, or the aqueducts yeah. exactly yes so since the the beginning of humanity um and that it can be applied subaqueously that um it has been used in um landfills and in other mining operations and they just continue to to harp that down um, now, our experts on the other side, um, you know, they, of course, bentonite is a natural material and it has been used for, for eons. However, um, in this, it has never been used in this particular application. And on top of that, um, we had Dr. Malusis, um, who was a uh, expert for the conservation organizations, was discussing um, the means in which bentonite will degrade over time. Um, we had mentioned cation exchange earlier. That was brought into the conversation of the effects of that swelling and how that swelling and that degradation impacts its ability to perform as intended as the decades elapse. Um, and then Water Legacy brought in their their witness, uh, Dr. Craig Benson, who is the expert in bentonite, the aficionado of bentonite, and has been working with this substrate for, oh my goodness, I think he said 40 years at one point. Um, and one of the things that I, that felt very um, convincing and it, I think it solidified our argument in total was that he has designed these the all kinds of various plans, landfills, mines, and when bentonite has been used, they are seeing now that it's degrading, that after 20, 30 years, it's not working as intended any longer. And that's a pretty short time frame when you're thinking about extending that to 50 years. And this it was it was a great cap to the end of this contested case hearing. Dr. Benson was the last to speak, and I think it left a very great way to end this contested case hearing in the, the eyes of uh, Judge Lefebvre. One of the things that struck me about Dr. Benson's testimony is um, how he talked about the last decade and the things that he has learned just in the last 10 to 15 years. 
um, he had actually consulted with one of the firms that PolyMet um, hired early on in the PolyMet proposal. And there are a couple of memos from him on various aspects of this. And, you know, he was questioned about that and said, yeah, at that time, he didn't have the information that he has now, which I found really persuasive. Yeah, he had a, a saying at some point about, you know, not applying the 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 failed lessons of yesteryear. I'm doing a bad job at summarizing it, but but basically just because it, we thought it was going to work 10, 15 years ago doesn't mean we should continue to go forward under those false presumptions. We've learned. Yeah, and it seemed like Malusis was really focused on the need to um, at least get more testing data. Yeah. Right? Well, and he's there's a professor. So, yeah, there's been so little, well, really almost none in the field testing of any of this. Um, and there are options, you know, the witnesses provided options. Max, what did you think of um, DNR's position during the hearing? You know, I, I think DNR was <clears throat> sort of all over the place a little bit, you know, with PolyMet's witnesses um, uh, and with uh, MCEA's witnesses, Water Legacy's witnesses, I, I think what you were seeing is you were seeing uh, an opportunity for those witnesses to be given a narrative chance, right, to to explain to the DNR um, why the, the expert thought that the Bentonite Amendment was workable, why it would, would degrade or wouldn't degrade. So in that sense, it was very much... Um, I think helpful to inform the DNR and provide, uh, you know, a, a dialogue for, for for those facts to develop. But DNR also called several of its own witnesses to sort of, um, I would say, uh, support its decision to grant the permit to mine and and to support its decision for why the Bentonite Amendment does make sense here. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at some questions. There's a lot of good questions in the Q&A, and there's no way that we're going to get to all these. Thank you. Thank you, folks, for putting them up. But there's a number of questions that are just kind of related to um, how this plan works. Maybe we need to say a little bit more about um, the bentonite layer. Um, is, is there going to be a layer on top of the bentonite? Um, how are they going to install it? Uh, are they going to install it while they're still mining? And if they're not installing it while they're still mining, then what about those 20 years while they're mining? How does that all work? Anybody want to? Yeah, I mean, I can I can take a stab at this, right? So I think it depends on the different application. There's three different applications. There's the dam slopes or dam faces. There's the, um, F, the flotation tailings basin pond bottom. And then there's the beaches, right? The, the, so it's sort of, you know, the, you saw the um, image that Kevin put up previously. And so the, the, you know, dam slopes go up to the top and then the beaches go down until they meet the water and then the water is where the pond is. And so, um, you know, I think the, the way that um, PolyMed is proposing to uh, install bentonite on the beaches and the pond bottom, my understanding at least, is that it would not be done for up to 10 years after closure. So the mine would operate for 30 years um, before bentonite is applied to the beaches or the pond bottom. Um, it was unclear for me, and, and so Heather, if you know this, or Kevin, if you know this, please let me know, but it, it was unclear whether the bentonite amendment would be sort of added face by face as new lifts are, um, you know, added or if they would wait until all the lifts are completed and then um, incorporate the bentonite amendment. But effectively what they proposed for the pond bottom is to, as Heidi has said, uh, subocutaneously, right, uh, apply uh, bentonite pellets on like some sort of spreader on a barge through the water column to be on the bottom. With the beaches, they would do some sort of, um, you know, mixing of the beaches, which are expected to be very wet, to allow for those to sufficiently dry out for there to be a homogeneous uh, spreading or application of bentonite. And for the uh, dam sides, 
they would, um, you know, typically to achieve maximum uh, homogeneity, you need to do use something like um, mix it off site, right? In some something uh, called a pug mill or some some equivalent of that. But here they're planning on doing it in situ, which means they would just effectively mix, um, you know, bentonite with the um, existing tailings and then add uh, after they create that 18 inch layer of bentonite and tailings. Uh, there would be a 30-inch uh, layer of LTB tailings on top of that. I see a good question here for you, Heidi, as a new lawyer. So we had a team of three lawyers um, here at MCA who were working almost full-time on this contested case hearing for many weeks leading up to it, and also our legal assistant. Um, Ann Cohen was the leader of the team, so shout out to Ann who couldn't be here today, but thank you, Ann, for all your work. And then Mel Lorenz. And Heidi was the third, and Eric Lindberg is our legal assistant. Um, so the question, Heidi, is what is it like to get ready for a week-long contested case hearing? Um, well, it was it's a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. I do not know. I don't know what the world would look like without Ann Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> she is an absolute powerhouse. Um, she was working, I don't think she took a day off for the last few months. I mean, she really worked so hard. And one of the things I really learned from her was, um, Anne has a saying about practicing law without, a, or excuse me, practicing science without a license. Mm -hmm. And so she really had to become fluent in so many of these very challenging science scientific topics. Um, just in order to be able to speak with our experts, in order to be able to ask the right questions, in order to communicate effectively, and in order to guide them in how to best um, speak to the interests of this project, um, how to speak the language of the law so that the judge was able to understand in a layman's term rather than that higher level scientific term. And that was that was a lot of work and it was huge to be able to be so fluent in something that is so complex. I mean, there are many people who participated in this case um, with PhDs and years and years and years of academic research and application. And so Anne being able to pick that up to have that translation in order to get to this final stage where we were just able to talk about it for five days straight that was a huge thing to um, to learn as a new lawyer and to witness in somebody who is experienced enough to be able to make that that translation occur. That's great. I heard at one time that you turned turn to your chemistry book. I did. <laughs> I did. I had to pull out my chemistry book to understand uh, cation exchange and uh, hydraulic conductivity. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm not fluent, but... <laughs> at least enough to be able to to have a conversation and understand what was occurring. That's great. Um, Max, tell us a little bit about what happens next. So the hearing concluded Friday. What are the next steps in terms of the procedure here? Yeah, sure, Kevin. Thanks. Um, so uh, effectively, the next steps are uh, post-trial briefings and proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. And in order to get that done, you need a, a, a detailed and correct, uh, you know, transcript of the proceedings. And there's a court reporter that's um, pecking this down the whole time, taking notes and, and putting this into writing. That's going to be, my understanding is that's going to be available to the parties um, mid-April. Um, May 26th, I believe, uh, the parties have to file 25-page briefs and uh, there's no page limit on proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. Um, the administrative law judge had mentioned um, a hope to um, uh, complete the uh, recommendation, um, report and recommendation sometime uh, in August, I believe he said. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it would be later than that. So, I, you know, probably the um, fall, late, you know, early winter of 2023. I, I think we'll get a decision by the end of 2023. At that point, when the report and recommendation is issued, um, it, it gets kicked to the agency. The agency can gives the parties an opportunity to submit something called uh, exceptions. And exceptions allows the parties to say, you know, 
you got this wrong, you got that wrong, um, and to submit, uh, you know, um, the rationale why certain aspects of the report and recommendation should be changed. Um, once uh, DNR gets it, it has 90 days to issue a decision, and thereafter, um, my guess is the result will be will be again in the Court of Appeals through a certiorari uh, challenge, right? An appeal of DNR's decision, and it's either going to be Polymet, you know, um, being uh, you know, the appealing party if DNR decides not to issue the uh, permit to mine or friends and MCEA and the band and water legacy if DNR ultimately does issue the permit to mine. One thing that's kind of interesting about the decision. So, um, you know, as Max mentioned, the ALJ makes a recommendation the DNR can either accept the recommendation or not. It's the DNR that's the decision maker. And the statute says that it's the commissioner, but in this case, actually, the commissioner has identified a different person as the decider. And so there's sort of a, a bright line or wall between the DNR litigation team and that decider. Maybe um, one of you can describe that a little bit more, too. Yeah, so they have identified um, Grant Wilson to be the decision maker. Um, and as Max had pointed out earlier, it's that Grant Wilson is a person who does not have mining experience. Um, but once the record is developed and once um, everything is in, this will be the person who is charged with making this decision as to how DNR should proceed forward from this contested case hearing with this permit. Um, and Max, do you want to speak to that? Uh, what would have, say that again? Oh, I just wasn't um, sure if you had anything to add. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, so, you know, you've got the decision maker, Grant Wilson, and then there's also an internal attorney for DNR, uh, Robert Carey, I believe is his name. And these two, uh, yeah, and, and uh, as mentioned in the chat, Grant Wilson is Central Region Director of uh, Department of Natural Resources. My understanding is he doesn't have mining experience. Uh, Robert Carey, so it's two individuals, right? Um, and it, it, it's unclear to me whether or not these two individuals have access to uh, technical support, right? Um, it seems like DNR has relied on a lot of its technical experts to be a part of the hearing team, right? They're, you know, it, it would be inappropriate for one of DNR's witnesses who presented at the hearing to be providing advice on the back end to the decision making team. So, you know, I, I'm curious to hear ultimately who are these two, this one decision maker, Mr. Wilson, and, and his supporting attorney, Mr. Carey, who are they getting technical advice from? Right? Mm -hmm. Because as Kevin said, if if DNR does choose to veer or stray away from the report and recommendation, you can't just say, I disagree. You have to provide a, a meaningful uh, explanation of why you disagree with a technical finding. Um, let me go to some questions here quick. Uh, is the assignment of the burden of proof appealable or is that now a done deal? That is definitely appealable. Um, you know, it, it is appealable. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. That will be an issue uh, for the appellate courts. Yeah, it's an issue for the appeal. I mean, in terms of the hearing right now and the way that the uh, judge is going to approach the case, it's kind of a done deal for the ALJ, but it's an issue that's preserved for appeal later. Um, let's see. Do we think that we accomplished the mission? Did we make all the arguments that we wanted to make? Uh, and are we going to get a decision that we're happy with? <laughs> That's a hard one. I mean, you know, I, I think we did a great job. I really did. I think we did a great job of explaining that a bentonite amendment wouldn't work here, right? It just, it, there are so many issues that it, it just would not work to, to cover, um, you know, the flotations tailing basin with the bentonite amendment. And on top of that, there are mo like major full sides of this that are not covered with bentonite. So those sides allow for air and water infiltration. And even if the bentonite amendment was able to be, you know, uh, applied uniformly, you know, so there's sufficient um, homogeneity, 
it would likely degrade and fail over time. It's not going to last 500 years. Um, there's, you know, cation exchange, which we talked about, and in combination with wet dry cycling, which is just a natural phenomenon here in Minnesota, right? It's wet in the spring, it's dry in the summer. That when those two, uh, you know, events, um, uh, you know, are found simultaneously, you, you know, there are significant, uh, you know, uh, degradations to the uh, bentonite layer. So I think we did a great job. I really do. I can Perhaps, and, Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Heidi. Oh, I was just going to say one of the things that the three of us had discussed earlier that I thought was um, a very, that was very effective and um, something worth pointing out is we were the only, petitioners were the only collection of people whose experts did not have an interest in this case. We, our experts were genuine experts and academics in the field who were just curious and helping out and contributing their knowledge and analysis to this. Whereas both PolyMet and DNR's witnesses each had some kind of stake and interest in this proceeding and in the outcome of it. And I don't, I feel like that was not lost on the ALJ. And we yeah, did a good job of making that clear. Yeah, and, and that's a really important point, Heidi. And thank you for bringing that up. And I'll just, you know, provide a couple of examples, right? One of the uh, witnesses of PolyMet, um, John Hull, owns a trademark or a patent on a product that is, you know, likely to be used if this gets green lighted, right? And th that that would be a very, very costly, um, you know, procedure. Uh, uh, also, DNR, uh, its geochemist, or sorry, uh, PolyMet's geochemist uh, witness would continue to provide consulting services if uh, the project got green lighted. So you, you have, and, and then Bar Engineering, right? You've got a VP. Bar Engineering includes, includes this project on its website. It's a billion dollar project. You know, it, it, there are significant financial um, impacts that these witnesses, you know, or benef financial benefits these witnesses would, would achieve if DNR green lights this project. Yeah, that, that's really true. And it's not even just the financial benefits. It's the fact that they've been working on this project and promoting it for 10 years. They're the same scientists. And this is true of the DNR. They're the same scientists that were advising the commissioner when she initially or initially issued the permit um, and so I think that they, you know, kind of natural reaction to be a little bit defensive of your work. Our, our experts were all new to this. And so I think that that you're right, Heidi, that wasn't lost on the ALJ. Um, it looks like we're nearing the end here. I want to give you each an opportunity if there's anything that you think that we missed that we should be sharing with folks about last week. Um, or about your experience in going through the contested case? What is it? I just have to say it was an incredible honor, quite frankly. Um, you know, as, as a new attorney and as a legal fellow here at MCEA, to be able to work with such brilliant minds, and the pun was not intended, <laughs> minds, um, on a case that has such huge impact. And this early out of law school to be able to be a part of something that really impacts all of us. Um, it was just, it was a, it was an absolute honor to, to be a part of it and to watch everyone collectively work so hard to, to be there. So, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say, yeah. Ann Cohen is a, you know, she always puts on a master class of, uh, you know, how to be a, a phenomenal, um, you know, uh, trial attorney, but always thinking of the appellate angles, right? I mean, she really, she, she's been a, um, a friend and a professional mentor uh, for me for a long time. She, she says she's raised me from a, a poly, polywog. So, <laughs> very good. All right. Well, we're going to have to wrap up here pretty quick. Um, so let me just say that, as I mentioned early on, we have a number of appeals uh, aside from this one of the PolyMet uh, permits. Um, we're waiting right now for the Supreme Court to issue decisions in our appeal of the Clean Water Act permit that was granted to PolyMet, also on a procedural issue related to the Clean Air Act. Um, the decisions of the Army Corps um, are 
still under appeal in, in various ways. We have a, a litigation in federal court that's been stayed pending a decision by the Army Corps on a case that was brought by the Fond du Lac Band. And um, there's also cases challenging the Forest Service and their decision to do the land exchange. So there are many things up in the air with this case, and we will be monitoring them and bringing you information about them as we get it. Um, I also wanted to let you know that Friends of the Boundary Waters has a big day tomorrow up at the Capitol. They're having a rally in support of the Prove It First legislation from 9 to 5. You can go up for a lobby day at 2 p.m. The rally is in the rotunda at the Capitol. So if you're available, go and support the Friends and that legislation. And then finally, I just want to say thank you again to our litigation team, Heidi and Mel and Ann and Eric. Um, and all of our client groups. You can imagine that putting this together was just really a lot of work, hundreds and hundreds of attorney hours. Um, and so we could not have done that without the support of folks like you. I wanna mention that as well. Um, we're happy to receive your donations and your donations make all of this possible, makes Max's work possible and our other clients is, as well. So thank you for your support. Max and Heidi, thanks for being with us today. And um, yeah, enjoy the day, everybody. Thank you for being here.